Hard the God Culture, a group of independent researchers with no affiliation to any denomination nor organization whatsoever. We read the word and we test it as 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. In our very first video, actually two years old at the recording of this video, we began to lay foundation for the proofing process in finding Ophir. If one just views that video, especially just part of it, and thinks they have enough, you haven't hardly begun the journey yet. At the end of this video, we are going to respond to an ignorant Gnostic who invokes atheist Jesus in his words, so you will know his obvious aim, is to mislead as anyone claiming God doesn't believe in himself is about as ignorant as they come. But nevertheless, he actually took the time to record two three-minute videos, and we are going to play his exact words for you, and we will respond. He will probably wish he never created those videos after this, but we don't mean to pick on him as much as address something that even some scholars have peddled as fact, which is simply not fact. Now, he didn't bother to even watch the entire first video even, which he criticizes because we covered too many scriptures, of course, making it just too long for his laziness to take his precious time of ascending to godhood eventually, evidently. Well, we can help you with that since that is a worthless pursuit in the first place, which no man can nor ever will attain. So, anyway, in preparing for our upcoming conferences, we were already going back and looking at further connections and really buttoning this case up. So, this video will firmly establish, and indisputably so, that Misha is in fact Mishad, Iran. And we will prove this with support from the Book of Jubilees, from Josephus, who is extremely specific. Now, Jaktan never lived in Saudi Arabia, period, the end. And we're going to end that debate now. And it is wholly unscholarly and without gnosis to assume such. We'll address this in full. Now, once that is established, we will take you in the direction of where Joktan's sons, especially Ophir, Havila, and Sheba, headed. Anyone who has watched the whole series already knows this is extremely well established. And no one has disproven it, especially not this ignorant Gnostic, but we will tie down Safar and the Mount of the East with specificity and completely and utterly obliterate not just this ignorant Gnostic, but the commentaries from Bible Hub that he uses and others, which are just plain wrong. And yes, we can say that with 100% certainty, having already proven it wrong in our series for those who have actually taken the time to watch it. In all fairness, knowledge is increasing, and these entries need to be updated. But nevertheless, anyone holding to those outdated, unbiblically supported, and geographically completely incorrect views may certainly do so, but may we all find the truth in this age. This will connect this with more detail and more facts than before. So there will be new additional proof. And again, if one watches the entire series, which this ignorant Gnostic in his own words admits he did not, 
watch even all of the first video, really. Well, Einstein nailed that best when he says, condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. And if the shoe fits, well, you know. Let's go. So picking up, this is our base scripture for the territory of Jockton. No, it is just one scripture of hundreds that we use, but it is an important one, so we will give him that. And his sons, especially Ophir, Sheba, and Havilah, are whom we are really tracking in migrations and presence. Now, as you continue in the series, you will find we do not rely on any one scripture, nor only on scripture, but we prove out the ships, the wood, the resources, the history, which is undeniable and already seals the case. When you view the history of the Philippines, according to actual historians, there is no debating where Ophir is. It is definitely in the Philippines. The science that supports it is overwhelming. The geography is way overwhelming. And the language, finding residual Hebrew in the language as mega place names. I mean, many of the mountains. You got to be kidding me. This case is so airtight. There is no way some Gnostic is going to come in and disprove it because of one scripture which he can't even disprove. In fact, you're going to see this is very laughable all in all and, and probably entertaining for many. We find it entertainment anyway. If you don't review it all, then there is nothing to debate about. It's like going to a big debate night. Okay, It comes and one side never bothers to actually review the writings the theories and the cases made by the other side at all, other than, well, let's say they had 30 books out there and they read part of one of them. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, there's no way that somebody can debate based on that. That is just, it, it is debating from a point of ignorance. And every time that side would lose royally to the point of embarrassment. And by the end of this video, Unfortunately, though not necessarily our intent, this is going to be very embarrassing for this guy. And we're not trying to point or pin, pin him out, but uh, we are responding because he's gone public with this, with his whole 124 views when we looked at it anyway. But when it comes down to it, he's putting himself out there. You know, he's trying. Maybe he's even trying to tell the truth. We're not saying that he's a liar, but what we are saying is that this is nonsense. And by the end of this video, you are going to know that for sure. There's not going to be a debate because it will be over. It's already over for anyone that's watched the series. So their dwelling was from Misha, the sons of Joktan, and Joktan, as thou goest unto Safar, a mount of the east. Now, do we locate Safar? And the Mount of the East in this series? Uh, not maybe, not possibly, but indisputably, definitely, 100% from many, many angles. Does this guy do that? No, he doesn't even bother to watch the evidence. And no, it does not rely on one scripture. That is stupid. But we are pulling that all together and expanding the case here for full clarification in order to head off any more ignorant Gnostics like this and this one. Now we covered that Misha means departure, which originated from this event where Jokten, Jokten and sons departed to the East. Yes, we do prove that indisputably, but don't worry, by the end of this video, we'll put a nail in it, which we certainly overwhelmingly do. But we will further fortify it now 
and his brother Peleg's generations headed west. We find that departure point to be Mashhad, Iran. <gasps> Where on earth did we get that? Wow. And that's what's being questioned. But it will no longer be questioned by the end of this video. Enter the Book of Jubilees. Now, we aren't convening a council today to enter this book into the canon of Scripture, but to deny its history when it's dated 200 B.C. at least would be fairly ignorant, and we'll support this with other sources too. But as a historic source, it is very adequate and very accurate, frankly, amazingly accurate, as we've mapped out the entire directions from the entire book, over four videos. And they're all over 42 minutes long, sorry, but that's what it takes to cover actual facts. Now, though we are accused by one never watching such videos, we literally map the complete directions. So go and check that out. And it actually gives exact directions even from all four directions to the Garden of Eden, which is the land of Ophir. And you will see we prove that thoroughly. However, Jubilees identifies that Joktan's family, which is from Arphaxad, son of Shem, son of Noah, originally inherited two places and only two places, and that's it up until the migrations of Yachtan, just after the Tower of Babel incident, when they spread out around the earth. But prior to that, two places. Therefore, we know this narrows down regarding the location of Misha, where Yachtan lived prior to that migration, very specifically. Now, we're going to support that with other sources. Yachtan's family, our Foxat, inherited the land basically known as Iran, Media, Persia, Chaldea. All the same, yes, Chaldea went into Iran and even as far as Afghanistan. And we will show you proof of that. Don't worry. Flowing into Iraq, basically, and east of the Euphrates River. Now, last I checked, Saudi Arabia is not east of the Euphrates River, is it? No. Now, that's just territory number one. So let's give them the benefit of the doubt here. There's a second territory, and it's basically what became Canaan and later Israel, as it's the promised land. Promised to whom? Not to Abraham. Promised to Shem. This is the ancient promised land that Canaan stole. Now, from the Red Sea, basically Ezion Gabir, right where Solomon built that Red Sea port, all the way north to the Euphrates, basically in Syria slash Turkey almost, and uh, in that area. Again, we literally map these out in detail. Then, Jubilees tells us Canaan, the son of Ham, stole the land of Israel from Shem's son, which, if you read further, his father, Ham, actually cursed him for breaking the territories allocated by Noah himself. By the way, this also proves that Israel cannot be Afri in Africa. For anyone who is attempting to change practically all of history, including the Bible, because they say history was written by white Europeans. Well, the Bible was not written by white Europeans and long precedes that. And it says Israel is in Shem's land and Ham's land is Africa. And Jubilees maps it out completely and it is indisputable. Now, that is a false narrative as well. So if Canaan stole the land of Canaan, Israel, where did the descendants of our fox sad, which include Yachtin and sons, where did they live at the time of this division of the earth in Misha? Well, there's only one option left. Basically, Iran, Chaldea, whatever name you wish to call it. Now, 
Josephus, by the way, confirms this as well, but in great detail, as he actually literally maps it out specifically, so we can find this and support exactly what we're saying. Now, we'll show you. We didn't go into this much detail in the very first video, which, again, was already 42 minutes long, but we do in the series. And again, we've added a little, but not that much. So, there really is no question nor debate what was considered the Chaldees in Josephus' time, especially. So again, in that area in Iran, there is the perfect candidate for the exact point of departure. But we do not have to prove that, really, as just to prove Iran, proves Misha, cannot be in Saudi Arabia, Ethiopia, nor on the east side of the Dead Sea, nor at the bottom of the ocean floor in the Indian Ocean, which is utter nonsense, just a stupid, ignorant suggestion. Uh, that, oh, it might be Atlantis. Or it, maybe it was a spaceship. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, right. Come on. That's nonsense. That's not logic. This guy's not actually operating in logic. There's no doubt about that. But we can prove that out further. So let's do so. Now, the claim of some scholars, even, and this ignorant Gnostic, is that, oh, there's a word, Misha, used another time in the Bible. So that has to be the Misha from Genesis 10. It has to because it's, well, Misha. It's got to be the very same. Now, you will see just how ignorant some tend to be in just not bothering to reason and research things out. It's really sad when you think about it. We did not think we would have to go here, but here goes the territory of Misha in Genesis 10, at the time of the Tower of Babel, just after it, in about 2200 BC, again, we're not making a case for actual dates, was it 2300, was it 2100, who cares? The point is the frame of reference. It's about 2200. And Moses wrote about 1600 BC. And he wrote about this era, so he covered this era. But he wrote about 1600 B.C. Now, we aren't making a case for exact dates, so that's not what we're doing here. Yet, major, major, catastrophic, Titanic is sinking problem with this false theory of ignorance. This Misha, the king of Moab, wait a minute, shouldn't he be the king of Misha if he comes from a territory called Misha? Uh, isn't that the way that actually works? Yeah, it is. Now, Misha, the king of Moab, is not only dated roughly in scripture, but specifically in archaeology, as he had a stele erected in 840 BC. Did you hear that date? Now, think it out for a second. This guy and some scholars would actually have you believe and are actually saying with a straight face, that the origin of the place called Misha, you know, from the era of 2200 B.C., is named after a king who lived 1400 years after the place was named. That is the height of ignorance. Not scholarly, nor Gnosis for that matter. So, we can dismiss that, but not so fast. We won't stop there. Look at the Hebrew word used for Misha from Genesis 10, and notice it is completely different from the Hebrew word used for the king of Moab, Misha. 1400 years later, I might add. Even though it was also 800 years after Moses wrote. So was Moses aware of the king of Moab named Misha, who hadn't lived yet for eight centuries later? Of course not. So it's another horrible deduction based on falsehoods. But even worse, what's Misha, king of Moab's territory? Is he called Misha, king of Misha? No. So obviously his territory is called 
Moab. That is where he lives. And that's a very small territory. So what is that? Did Moses know where Moab was? Would he have made the mistake of calling it Misha? No. Let's look. Moab was the son of Lot. When did he live? The time of Abraham. Okay. And Moses wrote this about 10 chapters after Genesis 10 and was well aware of Lot. Here's what he says. Thus were both the daughters of Lot. Now, this was through incest. This was after Sodom and Gomorrah. They thought the world had ended. They were living in a cave. So, this isn't as bad as it sounds, although it is incest and it is wrong. So, the daughters of Lot with child by their father. And the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab. And that's the first time the word, the name Moab is ever used in scripture, by the, the way. The same is the father of the Moabites. What is he? Misha, king of Moab, the Moabites. Unto this day. So, in Moses' day, that territory was called Moab. Was it called Misha? No. Okay, so Moab is the son of Lot from the time of Abraham. There is no Moab before that, but Moses knew who he and his territory were, and he says so. Was it called Misha in Moses' day? No. No record of that exists, period. Does he associate it with Misha in any sense whatsoever? No. Is it in Saudi Arabia? No. Yachtin never lived there. Moab is on the eastern side of the Dead Sea. Very well recorded in history. It's a very small area. So Moab is not Misha. Does a king named Misha, 1400 years after Yachtin's migration, have anything whatsoever to do with Yachtin's migration nor the name of where he lived in 2200 B.C. Absolutely nothing. Oh yeah, and there are two other Mishas mentioned even later in the Bible, also impertinent. But again, far too late to even be considered in this narrative. To do so would be to mislead, just as this ignorant Gnostic does in his long video. So, Moab is out. <clears throat> what about Misha in Saudi Arabia? We'll show you a few references, but this first one is laughable, really. Some so-called scholars have actually attempted to link Misha because it's listed in Genesis 10, along with Ophir, to a place named Ophira in Saudi Arabia. Now, okay, we admit it sounds close, doesn't it? Yes, but that's never enough. You have to prove it out. It's not scholarship to say, oh, it sounds similar, so that must be it. No, that's a good starting point. There's nothing wrong with that. Take an etymology, but then you take it further and prove it out. You will find every source Every source that ever draws this conclusion has not bothered to look up this word. How do we know that? We'll show you. We must require them to prove it from other angles. Or they are wasting our time, and scholars more so should have to prove things. It is not good enough to have initials behind your name. The responsibility is even greater at that point to not just open your mouth and say whatever you feel like saying. But you literally have to prove it, not based on what another scholar wrote or this book wrote or that book wrote, but what you can literally prove. And if you haven't gone through that process and you speak up, you are no scholar at all. But, they don't bother to prove things out much. And we see this all the time on this channel, and we prove that. No matter. We can research this. And here you go. Ophira. The name is composed of the name Ophir. Oh, so Ophir is there. Okay, but keep reading. 
And the final letter, which denotes a direction. Oh, what's that mean? Well, the meaning of the name is to Ophir, meaning not Ophir. Keep reading. Ophir, a former Israeli settlement at Sharm el-Sheikh in Sinai, existed from 1967 until 1982. Again, very recent, so wouldn't even be connected anyway. But what does it mean? Called towards Ophir, due to its location on the Red Sea, very sensible, on the route, supposedly, now that's really scholarly of you because you're saying now that Solomon didn't take the route, and this is a scholar? Yeah, right. Don't know who wrote this. We have sources there, but it doesn't give an author. But they got it from somewhere. On the route supposedly traversed by Solomon's ships en route to Ophir. Today, Ophir is the name of a strait. Again, that would have been towards Ophir. Wait a minute. So the name means what? Does it mean this is Ophir? Hey, Ophir here? No. It is towards Ophir, meaning the path to Ophir, in the direction of Ophir. Ophir goes by here, that way, not here. And it's on the Red Sea, and this is accurate. The ships of Tarshish went right by there, on their way to Ophir, which is not this place. But again, this is embarrassing to call this scholarship, as it is clearly a big flashing neon sign that says, Ophir is that way. Or better yet, not Ophir here. We do cover this, but this guy that we play at the end would not know that because he's just too busy and too lazy to actually review the facts. But we'll take the time to make two videos criticizing that which he has never even viewed or reviewed. But Josephus, the historian, nails this down with specifics. And it is amazing that even any scholar would write any encyclopedia article without checking Josephus of all people. Now, some would call that negligence, frankly, and we outright do. From Antiquities of the Jews, Book 1, we have the page number and everything there. You can look it up and verify this for yourself. Now, he Latinizes these names, which is fine, uh, but you'll notice they look very familiar to the Hebrew names. Now, Yachtin, one of the sons of Eber, had these sons, and then he lists the sons. We'll pick up with Sabaeus, which is Sheba, Ophir, uh, Uelat, Havila, it's the same, believe me. Uh, in fact, if you look it up, e Evilat, E-V-I-L-A-T, is Havila. Uh, it's the very same word, it's just been Latinized. And Jobab. These inhabited from, now, we know where these places are. They're more modern in history, and they're very easy to find. So, here's what Josephus says. These inhabited from Kofan, an Indian river, and in part of area adjoining to it. So, in place of Misha, because these are both connected, this is one territory, this is Misha. This is not so far. This is not where they go to. This is the point of departure, the point of origin, where they lived before they migrated. So, in a place called... Kofin. Now, Josephus specifically identifies an area between the Kofin River, which is well recorded in history, as the modern Kabul River. Where's that? Uh, it's not in Saudi Arabia, and it's not in Moab, and it's not in Ethiopia, and it's not on the bottom of the ocean floor. It is in Afghanistan. You say, oh, wait a minute. 
Afghanistan, you said Iran. Keep reading. Because where do they go to? And in part of Aria adjoining to it. What is Aria? Well, in history, in Old Persian, the word Aria is Arian. It's the same thing, which is the root of the modern name, which actually is the ancient name of the area as well, before it was Persia, and actually it even went back and forth if you look through history, but the name Iran. So, and not all of Iran, but just a part of it that connects. So basically, within this red circle, perhaps it goes a little further west. We don't know. Josephus does not say, but notice something. Where's Mashhad, Iran? Right there on that border in Iran, right next to Afghanistan. Exactly as described by Josephus. And then, yes, it does sound like, look like, and is the same word as Misha, spelled M-E-S-H-A-D, with a D on the end instead, but still very appropriate. But again, we don't just rely on that etymology alone. We have firm history with firm directions, and we'll show you a map. Look at that, a map, wow. This is not something that one can actually debate, nor did this guy prove anything, as you see. He's wrong. Now, as you will see from the end video, we were accused of not using maps. Well, yes, we do. Throughout the series, hundreds of maps. But again, this ignorant Gnostic would not know that because, well, as he says, he admits he only watched part of one video. The very first foundational video in a series of 30 and then dares to... <laughs> produce, well, I guess you call that produce, I'm not sure what you'd call that, <laughs> uh, you'll see, but that is sheer stupidity. So, you can see the start of Yachtan's territory is in Iran, basically, and that is not Moab, is it? It's not Saudi Arabia, it's not Ethiopia, nor is it submerged in the Indian Ocean, is it? Yeah, he says that too. The only thing that is at the bottom of the ocean floor is your nonsensical theory. That's all. But he does have scholarly sources for his ignorance. But that makes it no less ignorant as his ship is sunk. And shame on those scholars for not doing their research, frankly because they have not. Now here are some more. Here's Easton's and Smith's Bible Dictionaries, two credible sources on many topics. But you know, when it comes to ancient geography, they just don't know. And we've proven that so many times on this channel. And they definitely don't have it right on this topic. Now in all fairness to them, they start with these two articles with the word supposedly... So they aren't saying this is fact, yet this guy is telling you that they're saying it's fact. They are not. They don't know. They're saying supposedly. Perhaps we need to define that word for an ignorant Gnostic, but we're not going to bother. He can look that up. Supposed, supposed by some, to be the ancient Himeretic capital, Shafar, Okay, so now we got the word game going on again. So, because it's Safar, then Shafar must be the same word, right? Wrong! Zafar, on the Indian Ocean between the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea. Okay, first, Shafar is a direct Hebrew word of completely different meaning and spelling, with no association to Safar. So, that's wrong anyway. But again, just because it somehow rhymes is meaningless. That is not enough to call proof of anything. 
Now, we have no issue with one looking at etymologies. That's great. It's a good place to start. That's fine. We do that. But we don't rely just on the etymology. We prove it out from other directions, which is how you should do this. Otherwise, you're really saying nothing. And that's pretty much what this says. Now, far worse, and this is really sad, Zafar, Yemen, which is where this is, was founded in the 2nd century B.C. <laughs> Sorry to laugh, but wait a minute. When did Joktan's sons depart, who never lived in Saudi Arabia anyway? Well, about 2200 B.C., 2,000 years before that. So, can a place name originating from 200 B.C. be the origin of a place from 2,000 years earlier? Nonsense! They just don't think this stuff out. Again, it is so sad. And if you look at the very word Zafar, with a Z, it's an Arabic Muslim name meaning victory. This is a Muslim term, largely, and this is what you're see, seeing going on here, where Islam is attempting to make claims of biblical origins, which it has none, no such, none whatsoever. It's a new religion, and it is not based on the Bible. Now, let's look at another. And unfortunately, another typically reputable source, which, you know, we didn't go here in this part of the series, especially not this early, although later we do just because we could not ignore the really ridiculous conclusions being drawn by much of modern scholarship. It really, really, just as these, it, it just escapes reason completely. How on earth do they, do they do this? And the reason is, is they're so far off because they're thinking within a controlled paradigm. It doesn't allow them to think outside of it or they'll be ridiculed. And as a scholar, you don't want to be ridiculed. Well, how about being right? Because they're certainly not right in these cases. And unfortunately, these are laughable references as well. But this one doubles down on ignorance. But again, they do not know of what they speak. They really don't. They haven't researched this, obviously. Now, the International Standard Bible Dictionary, which we greatly respect, says, as the eastern limit of the territory of the sons of Yachtan, Yachtan, it can hardly be doubted. Can hardly be doubted. Oh no, we've already proven this wrong that Safar is represented by the Arabic Kafar. Well, your other two dictionaries called it two other names. So, which is it? Well, evidently, it's every word that rhymes, right? The appropriateness of this site seems to outweigh the discrepancy. Wait, wait, wait. so you admit there's a discrepancy and you're going to outweigh, of it, outweigh it because of the appropriateness? Because what? It sounds like the same word, but is not the same word. That is really funny. In Hebrew, the Q would be a K. It is not the same word. Between Arabic Z and Hebrew S. So, did they render a name with a Z? No. They rendered a name with a Q. <laughs> So they just don't know what they're talking about. So now we've gone through Shafar, Zafar, and Kafar. So the logic applied by these so-called scholars is, well, it rhymes. That's all. And that's all we need. We could draw conclusions now because it rhymes. That's not very bright. They actually do this often, or worse, even stretch areas like Tartesis, Spain is having to be Tarshish uh, because it starts with a T-A-R, maybe? Uh, that's enough. And then you find out that Tartesis is actually a fictional area. No evidence it ever even existed, but it happens to be in the wrong direction because the Bible says that Tarshish is a three-year journey east. 
And no one bothered to tell the king of Spain he was already in Tarshish and never needed to spend all that money trying to find it in the Southeast Pacific. I mean, was he crazy? Of course not. Yet, he even puts it in writing, in contracts, which we cover. He obviously knew that Tarshish was not Spain. Yet, scholars will stand entrenched on those kinds of things, and they are ignorant on this topic. They just are. And we assure you, none of them have, nor will they, prove the conclusions of these videos wrong. And this ignorant Gnostic definitely doesn't begin to even head in that direction, as this is the foundational video. And, and that's all he's picking on, a foundation, and he hasn't even gotten to where we test this foundation thoroughly from many directions. But the foundation of his case is already disproven twice, three times, maybe even four times now. I lost track. Now, Misha is Mashad Iran, or at the very least, if you don't want to say that, okay, it's Iran. It's at least that part of the world. Therefore, not Saudi Arabia, not Yemen, not Ethiopia, not Moab, and never, ever ridiculously assumed to be on the bottom of the Indian Ocean. That is funny. Those are all nonsense with no such ties to Yachtin at any point, period. He never lived in any of those areas, nor near there at any time, period. We showed you one definition of the word Safar to which Yachtin's sons journeyed. Towards a numerous population, and oh look, the most numerous population on earth is in the Orient, not Saudi Arabia, not Ethiopia, not Moab especially, and most definitely not at all the bottom of the Indian Ocean. At least we hope not. Maybe his next point will be there's an alien base down there. Who knows? It would make as much sense as any of his so-called facts which we have obliterated. Okay, to Safar, the Mount of the East. The Hebrew word Kedim, which means east or front. So, from Misha, Meshad, Iran, Yachtin, and Sons, headed east. Now, we'll prove that out further, but it's really not that difficult. But let's take this further, and we take it much further in following videos, in fact, which this ignorant Gnostic is too lazy to watch as he is ascending to godhood or something, after all, and shouldn't be expected to spend his precious time actually watching the evidence before condemning it, especially based on things we cover in great detail. But maybe, if he actually watched this video beyond three minutes, which is doubtful, he can be educated. Well, maybe... Now, here's the very odd thing. This word Kadim is the same word used in Genesis 2 regarding the Garden of Eden that Yahuwah planted Kadim, eastward. And then again in our base scripture here, of very many, of course, in the Mount of the East, Har Kadim. This is a very ancient word of multiple meanings and all apply really is that is how ancient words work, largely. They develop multiple definitions over thousands of years. Now, we prove that many times over on this channel. It means east, antiquity, front, that which is before, afore time. So we're talking about the beginning, the origin of all things, are you seeing these definitions? Ancient, from of old, 
Earliest time? You mean like creation and the Garden of Eden? Yeah. Beginning creation. Mount of the East. Now we're going to show you that is actually a physical mountain, a well-recorded mountain, one of the four holy places of Yahuwah. The Mount of the Orient, eastward to or toward the east. See, it comes with, it, with, its, with its own descriptors, so it actually doesn't need some of the extra words that are there in Scripture many times. Even Mount of the East, it doesn't even need Har for Mount. It is already, by definition, the Mount of the East. Why is it all of these things? How can it be all of these things at once? Well, this certainly seems to tie in to the land of the Garden of Eden, which we prove is the Philippines. Uh-oh, another video coming. I'm sure he won't watch all of part 12 because it's multiple videos and some of them are over an hour long even. So I guess, you know, he'll disprove something he never watched there too, maybe. Uh, yeah, probably not. He will be embarrassed once again. And the land of creation this leads to, which is the Philippines. And the land of Adam and Eve, which is the Philippines. Which is Ophir, Sheba, Tarshish. And we prove all of that out many different ways in the series. Now that's odd, or is it? If this ignorant Gnostic had watched the rest of the videos, he would know just how foolish his points are. But we'll help him out here, if he can make it this far in the video, that is. See, the word safar also has many meanings, and oh look, they also lead to the Garden of Eden, as this is a Hebrew reference to the Tree of Life in Kabbalah. Now, we are not Kabbalists, we don't condone Kabbalah, we hate Kabbalah, to be frank. However, it's a Hebrew word, and this proves tied to a reference to the Tree of Life, which is where? In the Garden of Eden. And you would think a Gnostic would know that, but again, we'll educate him some here. So, what is Genesis 10 actually saying? It's saying to Safar, you know, the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, which is also tied to the Mount of the East. Now, can we locate the Mount of the East? Actually, we do in great detail, but we're going to give you just a taste because we go through multiple directions and sources and history and really prove that one out to actually find the specific mountain, and it's in the Philippines. Now, is it Mount Sinai, as this ignorant Gnostic is going to tell you it is, and it has to be, because, well, that's uh, one of Yahuwah's holy mountains. Well, it is one of Yahuwah's holy mountains, and we'll cover that, but Jokhtan never lived in Saudi Arabia. Oops. The Book of Jubilees also identifies this Mount of the East, as there are four holy places of Yahuwah on earth, who this passage even calls Lord of the Mount. What Mount? The Mount of the East. Why? Well, because the Garden of Eden and the Mount of the East, which we drill down very far, proving that they are in the same area. The Mount of the East is in the Garden of Eden, and so is the Tree of Life. So you literally have a double reference that says the Garden of Eden land, the Garden of Eden land. That's what it's saying. And that is not in India. In fact, it's beyond India, according to the Book of Jubilees, which gives us exact directions. And it's east of India, which does not include Ethiopia, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Moab, or the bottom of the ocean floor next to Madagascar. <laughs> None of those. So, now, also it includes, though, 
because there's those two and they're in the same area. Then it includes Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. Oh, wait a minute. If Mount Sinai is listed separately, then that would mean that Mount Sinai is a different mountain and not the Mount of the East, is it? Exactly. Now, he guessed that it is, and I believe he says he's guessing, but it doesn't matter. He's guessing wrongly. But again, Yachtan never lived in Saudi Arabia, so really already prove, proven wrong. Now, here's a neat connection as well. Another name for the Mount of the East is the Mount of the Morning. Now, in some references, it actually says that, which makes sense. East, morning, because that is where the sun rises. That's one of the other things he says is we don't know where the sun rises. Well, no, you don't know where the sun rises because it rises in the far east. Duh. And yes, we know where it rises. In fact, take a look at this because this land is inextricably tied to the land of the morning, just as the Philippines National Anthem identifies it as the land of the morning that has the mountain of the morning. And their flag would also suggest it with the land of the sun. Oh, we take that so much further. That wasn't proving anything yet, but we're giving you a taste. And we do go there and we do prove it out. But it takes a lot more than three minutes to prove anything for that matter. Again, we completely map out the entire directions from the Book of Jubilees, turn by turn, and all of them. And they cover the entire earth. It's fascinating when you see where it all leads. But the Garden of Eden, where Safar, the Tree of Life, is, and the Mount of the East is, are on Shem's eastern border. Again, we can't do it justice without the whole directions. So if you are not an ignorant Gnostic, and we'll take the time to watch. We do this in parts three and four of our flood series, mapping out the book of Jubilees completely, and then we return to Solomon's Gold series in part 12, and we locate over two videos the Garden of Eden with specificity. And it's right there and has been all these thousands of years. It is in Shem's eastern border, and Noah even gets more specific with markers that are undeniable. Watch those videos and you will see they get to it. And no, we're not going to abbreviate that here and try to fit it into three minutes. Can't do it. So where did Yachtan head? Well, from Misha, Iran, he headed to the Philippines. Do we even conclude the Philippines in the first video? Actually, no. We don't even draw that conclusion. It's a foundational video where we're testing some of the markers in Scripture only so that we can bring them all up, have it all there, and then we go into history and science and language and all of these other disciplines to prove it out as well as other Scriptures for that matter. See, that's how you prove things. You don't try to do it in three minutes. This ignorant Gnostic wouldn't pay attention to such details as he wants to say what he wants to say. And you are just supposed to believe him because he said so. Well, just watch the way he can't even seem to read a map. This is very entertaining. So now, without further ado... Let's hear from the ignorant Gnostic. Okay, this is supposed to be a quick video. Let's see how messed up it gets just because I'm trying to do it quickly. Joktan, son of Ophir. His dwelling is from Mesha in thy coming towards Safar, a mount of the east. So his dwelling is someplace from a location called Mesha, and towards Sephar. And it says it's a mount of the east. There's also 
the fact that Mesha is also the name of the king of Moab. So we're going to track this real simple, hopefully. This is a map that I found that shows where Mesha is. It's right here. Now this is up at the bunny rabbit end of the Red Sea or whatever the hell it is. Okay? I don't know what I'm looking at. Anyway, this is supposed to be Safar. This is the angle going towards it, which is the map here is really badly done as is typical from religious websites, but it's supposed to be on this end near Yemen and the Sinai, apparently, which means it's pointing mostly south. It's not to the east. So it's an angle that location, and it's at that end of that peninsula. So let's go back to what it said. It said, you can find Ophir, which is a person, from Mesha towards a mountain called Safar. And again, Nesha is right there near the Red Sea, and there's the Gulf of Suez going down. Excuse me, not Gulf of Suez. There's the. Ri- you get the idea. Let me get this back again. There, Red Sea. Anyway, it's from the. It's from there. Gulf of Aqaba. Can't they just give it a goddamn stable name? Anyway, from there, and then all the way down to the other end of that body of water, to way over here. And that's the Red Sea at the other end of it. So it's almost it's southwest. Okay, you could use that as an angle pointing towards the Philippines potentially. Look on a map, see if it actually does that. Use the flat map, not the spherical one, please. Flat earther joke. Now, where is Moab, which is the king's name for Moab? Well, it's over here. So it actually goes at a slightly different angle, which would point it north. So none of these are pointing towards, um, well... The Philippines. And this, in fact, goes out of its way to basically imply that Ophir is referring to or mixing up the name of a person with the location called Ophir in the Bible. Now, why am I doing this? Video number one in the Gold God series alludes to this, and it's the only thing they talk about you can double check. That's all they're talking about. The whole video. That's the only pertinent point. The rest of it is pointing out that the name Ophir is in the Bible repeatedly and people describing how much wealth you can get from it. Instead of concentrating on what you can gain from it, it should be about where it is and how to locate it. And it doesn't show any facts that would back up their assertion that it's the Philippines. Thanks for watching. Have a good day. Good luck with that. He is too lazy to actually watch, and yet had the nerve to challenge that which he has not reviewed. Really making Einstein's quote very appropriate for this video. Condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. The odd thing here, though, is you have a Gnostic who is actually quoting Bible scholars without question. Quite the oxymoron. We already covered that Misha, king of Moab, was born 1,200 years after, or actually 1,400 years after Yachtan, and 800 years or so after Moses wrote the book. So it is rather ignorant to say a place was named after a guy who was born 1,400 years later, isn't it? And that guy is not even from a place called Misha either. He's from Moab which even Moses records in his day. So he was well aware that was not Misha and would not have called it that, would he? And that Misha, king of Moab, isn't even the same word as Misha, the place in Genesis 10. So, nope, strike three, you're out. It's amazing how much attitude one can (laughs) have wallowing in so much ignorance. Now, regarding Saudi Arabia, we covered that too, and there is no actual precedence which ever places uh, Yachtan and Sons there. Never does it establish Saudi Arabia as Misha, nor Safar, as Yachtan's Sons lived in Iran, not Saudi, nor Israel, nor Ethiopia, and most certainly not what he's about to tell you on the bottom of the ocean floor in the middle of the Indian Ocean, so he can tie in his occult Atlantis stupidly. So, this is simply false, and you can see where he's trying to lead to with his occult narrative. It is one big fat lie. 
It is certainly ignorant not just of him, but of any scholar who reads this passage and says Yachtin's sons only lived in one place in Saudi Arabia and then stayed in the same country. It was a great big long journey to, well, the next town. Because that's what they're showing on the maps. Okay, some, or maybe a few towns over. But you got to be kidding me. <laughs> and it's, it's as if they didn't realize that people could boat. Uh, you know, that Noah built a ship, yet for thousands of years, no one could figure out how to make something float again. Yet a child can do it in five minutes. Yeah, that makes a lot of logical sense, doesn't it? <laughs> you would think before writing a commentary. They just may have reviewed Josephus, of all writers. Just maybe. But they are equally guilty of not doing their research, but catering to a false paradigm that this guy's ignorance is picking up on. But there's no excuse for his ignorance. Nevertheless, he did not do his research, and he's being very complacent and extremely lazy by not even reviewing the case. And this is embarrassing to him, at least it should be. We understand he doesn't know any better than to just look up Bible Hub, etc., and just accept what they say, which is kind of odd for a Gnostic, but okay, with no research, but none of those scholars have ever located Ophir, nor do they really claim to. I mean, usually when you look at the language, he says, oh, everybody says it's in India. Uh, first, that's not true. That's not even remotely the, the common narrative of tradition. Very few say it's India. Um, and they're all wrong. That's wrong, too, and we prove that. Uh, we have a whole video called Not o Fear where we deal with that in more detail. And this guy, far worse, a Gnostic who is quoting theologians. That's pretty laughable. Only when it is convenient, of course, for his case, but then he takes his occult direction, which was his real intent here, other than to agitate and confuse Filipinos especially. And that's why we're giving this attitude back, because we reject that, we rebuke that wholeheartedly. And then he just had to sneak in, well, maybe it's Atlantis. Yeah, well, maybe a spaceship landed. I mean, it's just so ridiculous. Notice he doesn't show one single reference for where that stupid assertion came from, did he? But says many say, yeah, who? Because if you read your own occult literature, you will find that Atlantis is in the Atlantic, not the Indian Ocean. But again, he's just talking out of his, well wrong end, let's say, because this is just a whole bunch of nothing. See, this is what Gnostics do and why we wanted to show you this. They mix in references, like trying to claim Egyptian, the Egyptian language, is Hebrew, and it is not. It's not even tied to Hebrew. Here's what's fun. Yachtin's story has no mention of the Red Sea, nor the direction of the south, only east though southeast is fine. He draws lines almost due south, huh? And says, that's the only southeast. Well, isn't southeast a lot larger than that? I mean, that's quite a hatchet job, but you gotta follow his lines. And if it's not in his lines, it, it, it can't be right. Well, except for India, because maybe it could be India, he says, and India is not in your lines. Really? He drew them. He drew two of them. Then they became four of them. It, yeah, it is just absolute nonsense. Regarding the length of our videos, this is a challenge to keep them as short as possible, but cover things and really prove. We're tired of watching videos that don't prove, like this guy's, where he just sits there and spouts off. I mean, you know, anybody can do that and not have a clue what they're talking about. And that's where he's coming from. And there's a lot of YouTube videos out there that will do that. We refuse to do that. We offer proof. And one can prove absolutely nothing in three minutes. But they can do a really good job of playing a fool. Really good. This guy just proved that very well. If he even watched part one in its whole entirety, 
he would already see what a fool he is. But to rush to judgment on a 30-part series of mega evidence and assume a foundational first video in which we just set the foundation of the story from Scripture, partially? Give me a break. And did he prove anything wrong? Not in this video. No. He only proved himself a fool. But wait a minute. He put up a second three-minute video on the very same day, and maybe, just maybe, it's more compelling, perhaps. Well, we won't tease you. It's not, but we'll play it anyway. Here goes. Okay, the Solomon's Gold series at uh, the God Culture, where Ofer isn't. Microsoft Com so Comic Sans low budget introduction while not wasting 40 minutes of your life, over 9,000 hours in Microsoft Paint for XP. If Jokton's son Ofer's dwelling is from Mesha, we can consider that either as a city Mesha or Moab's king Mesha. Those are the only two options I can come up with that are implied strongly. And the idea here is, of course, that Ophir is a person, even in God Culture's, you know, video number one that goes on for 42 minutes. If it says, in thy coming towards Sephar, a mount of the east, well, it points southeast because that's the location most likely it. And Mesha is up in their left, whether it's either of them. This would have to be the passage to Ophir if you really want to use that passage literally. And again, it's to a person, not a location. Why this was done by the God culture, I don't know. But they don't point the direction. They don't give you the map. Now, I'm not misinterpreting things. And yeah, I kind of, I kind of did a goof and uh, and uh, derped a lot in the previous video. But no, really. I'm really trying to make that passage a reality. It's not pointing east. And the only locations that are listed as that mountaintop are right there. So either somebody was grossly inaccurate of their estimation as to where the sun sets and, and, and rises, or it's pointing this way. And uh, by the way, in the previous video I mentioned, but that's north, or that points northeast. I meant towards Moab from that location. I'm, I'm talking about the differential. But this is the map area. Now, I'm not saying Atlantis. I'm saying the only Ophir I can see here that would be a lost island would be out right that second circle. Or it could be pointing that way, or it could be completely not pointing to it and just pointing to that that pinch point there, which is often listed as the most likely location. Again, most people agree that it's actually India. Hey, Solomon Goad cult chirp. How is this pointing to the Philippines? This is a really simple thing. Now, again, people have said, all you have to do is go through and disprove their assertions. No, they have to prove their assertions by logical scenarios and processes and whatever. And this is literally the whole point of that first 42 minute and some odd second video. Thanks for watching. Have a good day. Atheist Jesus loves you. Uh-oh, look out. He pulled out the extensive graphics on this one. Oh no. We're in trouble now. He drew two lines. Based on what? Nothing he understands at all, nor has he bothered to logically test this at all, nor are they southeast. <laughs> They're basically south. He just reads a reference and points the finger in ignorance, foolishness. Watch his lines. They are two places he claims are Misha, both wrong. We've proven indisputably wrong. But then, they miraculously become four lines. How's that? And they point southeast. No, they don't. They point basically south and just barely east, if that. Some directly do south, basically. They even cross. Well, how do they cross? Because in order for them to cross, one must be going southwest. Oh, that's really stupid. <laughs> Based on what? Ah, oh, he ends with Atlantis. Very misleading. And most people believe Ophir was in India, he says, which is also actually a rare view. But regardless, yet another 
based on a loose etymology of an Egyptian word for a place in India known as Sophir, which is an Egyptian word. And somehow that's supposed to connect back into Hebrew, which is not Egyptian, to equal the word Ophir, which it does not. Even the word Ophir, by the way, is not even spelled O-P-H-I-R. It starts with an Aleph, which it starts with an A, and we will cover that. In fact, India's source of gold was not on mainland India according to their own history, but an island, get this, to the east in the East Indies, not India. And we locate that island as well in this series, as well as the same island referred to as Christ by Greece and Aria by the Latins, the Romans. The source of gold is the Philippines for all of these places in history. And we prove it. Now, you're going to have to watch all of the evidence to see that. Many make that mistake, though. But it is not scientific and easily shelved as everything he has said really can be. Yachtin is never recorded as southeast. He's recorded only as east, which is really the only direction necessary. Which this guy rejects, but then he draws southeast. Well, okay. Now prove that southeast is anywhere whatsoever in the passage. It is not. But that's okay. We'll even give you southeast. Because what's southeast of the Red Sea port? The Philippines. What's southeast of Misha, Iran? Oh, the Philippines. So you're actually proving us right. Thank you. Because our findings are in your directions. You just don't know how to draw lines. We can help you with that. We can give you a little lesson on where southeast is. It is not due south. And lines that run southeast do not head southwest. Just so you know. Just so you know. Just a little help there. Yachtin is never recorded as southeast. Now, Yachtin never lived in Saudi Arabia according to scripture. Oh, but that's okay. We'll give it to him. Even if so, he then traveled southeast from there, and his lines don't even start in the right place. It is so ridiculous. He doesn't even have a starting point, right? Whether alone, he has no midpoint, no end point, and draws a line. How do you do that? How do you know it goes southeast to that degree and not southeast to a much larger degree? And again, how do you know it doesn't go southeast to the Philippines? Well, it does, in fact, in relation to the Red Sea port and Misha. So, this video is produced in absolute folly. You don't just draw meaningless arbitrary lines on a map and then say that must be the trajectory. It can only be that, especially when you only have one point, the start. You can't even draw a line with one point. You just can't do it, especially when southeast is a whole quadrant. So you'd have to draw a quadrant that it would be in. And oh, by the way, that would include the area of the Philippines. <laughs> so it's really funny and very laughable. We appreciate the entertainment value of this, however. You think you're a smart Gnostic, and unfortunately, you are a fool. Now, coming into our domain, attacking us with no proof, Faking that you are actually smart enough to pull this off, even a video and reading a map, which you cannot give me a break. This fool establishes that Solomon's navy had to go southeast. And yeah, duh, that is exactly what we say. But then he ignores all of those other scriptures that he says are useless because he didn't listen. You know, the ones we cover the 50 or so just in the first video alone, um, and the maps that we don't actually use, yet we do, uh, and we know how to use ours, in fact, at least, so, yet he misses the fact 
that it is a three-year round-trip journey. That was in those other scriptures. In the first video, hello, three-year round-trip journey. And actually, in part five, we even play another Gnostic uh, from the History Channel confirming and reaffirming that that is, in fact, the case. And he's saying that it could have gone as far, uh, based on the ships of that day, as Australia or that, uh, you know, longitude, latitude, whatever, latitude, I guess. But the reality is, this is just complete nonsense. He proves nothing at all. And you can judge that for yourself. And then the ending, and this we must address, Atheist Jesus, could you be more ridiculous than to say that God doesn't believe in himself? Really? That shows who this guy really is. He's ultimately just another deceiver, with no intention of telling the truth, and certainly not loving you, as he says in the end. He does not, or he would not take such a journey of nonsense to mislead you. We'll ignore his ignorant closing remarks about us, because they're just stupid. You know us, and whom we are, and well know this series is not about gold gods, which is incredibly ignorant. Yeah, and it's Solomon's gold series. Funny how some Americans have such a tough time understanding their own native language. That is really sad. The fact is, he's just agitating. But nevertheless, we are responding because one thing, even though we were planning to anyway, as we prepare for these upcoming conferences, at least it forced us to take another look at our first video and first videos, which we'd already been done, looking at different ways to connect them together, fill any gaps that we feel like we didn't explain fully, uh, and that's all well and good. So perhaps we should thank him for his entertainment value, because this has been funny, at least we think so, and also for, in a sense, forcing us to take another look at this, though we did prove this very well in the series, if you actually watch it, which he wouldn't know. Because, see, it takes over three minutes to do anything, and especially to prove anything. We certainly hope his wife gets more quality time. Wait till you see the upcoming video on the origin of Upaz, the land of gold, which we are expanding as well, because we have found some things that will blow your mind. The gold of the Pisan River. You know the river from Eden, from Genesis 2, and its indisputable ties, even in language, as the very origin of all gold in all of history and Oh, is this good, what we have found. It leads to the very chemical symbol and the origin of the word for gold. This is going to just blow you away. The case is growing stronger and stronger. And this does not rely on the Lost Tribes series, by the way, as Ophir was proven long before our research headed there. So there is literally not one thing this ignorant Gnostic has said, which has any value whatsoever. The only thing on the bottom of the ocean floor is his ignorant theory. Thank you for watching our Solomon's Gold series. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to click the bell or just click the next screen. Share this video with others and check out our website at thegodculture.com. Always remember to prove all things for yourself. Yahuwah bless, and on our upcoming conferences in the Philippines in May, we offer our updated schedule next, as we are getting very close now, and we thank everyone who is involved. This will be quite a month, and only the beginning. We also provide a link to register, and don't forget to register for the conferences so our hosts can prepare. Ya bless. We are so excited 
As our schedule continues to grow for May 2019, we would like to take a moment and thank all those who are praying for these upcoming conferences in the Philippines and all those who have given to support the effort on Patreon. It is so helpful to have your support going into the schedule and future conferences. We can't wait to get out and meet many of you and deliver the message of Solomon's Gold series to many who have never watched the videos even. This will be a process, but this is a great start beyond our expectations. Around 15 dates are booked now, and what a month this will be. But it will not end there, so if you cannot make a conference, there will be more to come, hopefully for many years. We have had so many step up on so many levels, even some taking on full event responsibility. And thank you to all our hosts who are working so hard to prepare. We also want to thank our partner, Pastor Paul Madrano, who has done so much to make these events a reality. We love you, Pastor Paul and Susan. It's getting close now, and if you feel led, there will be a link on the next screen that you can click and give to support these conferences still. This is not merely an effort of the God culture, but so, so many. And thank you all so much. The Philippines is truly rising. Rise, Sheba, Ophir, and Tarshish. Rise. Yahuwah bless all.